What do you want the story of your life to be about? When your time is done on this planet, what story do you want people to tell about you? Maybe you want it to be about something you accomplish or achieve, something that your children and grandchildren can be proud of. Maybe you want the story to be about your children and grandchildren. You want your story to be about family. She was such a loving wife and mother. He was the best granddad. No matter what it is, we all have a story that we want our lives to tell. And it's what we give the majority of our time, attention, energy, and effort towards. But what do you do when the story you want is not the story you've got? What happens when you don't accomplish your dreams or your family doesn't turn out like you expected? Well, in this video, we will discover how we can become a part of a story much greater than the circumstances we find ourselves in. Because your story and my story was not meant to just be about ourselves. We are called to be a part of the story God has been telling since the beginning of time. Here at Community Christian Anywhere, we believe that even though our stories may be complicated, confusing, and even difficult to live in at times, Jesus offers us a life story that is full of meaning and rest. And it's found when we choose to live out Jesus' central command to love God and every person just as he has loved us. And we believe this life is available to you even if you're not sure you believe in God right now, because no matter what you think about God, we believe he can't stop thinking about you. He's for you and he has the best life possible in mind. And throughout this video series, we've been discovering all God has in store for us by examining these 12 simple words. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And in this video, we've come to the end and we want to talk about how the Bible tells me so about Jesus and his love for all of us. Maybe you're not even sure you believe in the Bible or maybe even God, but I hope you'll stick throughout this video because I hope that you'll find the story of the Bible is much bigger than just a book. It can be the story of meaning and purpose you've been searching for in your life. Hi, my name is Nathan and welcome to Community Christian Anywhere. What I found in talking to people about Jesus is that lots of people know the stories from the Bible, but they don't know the story of the Bible. And, and that might seem like a play on words, but it's not. It's really a big deal. Because what I found is that when you don't know the story of the Bible, well, you have a tendency to discount the stories in the Bible. In fact, some of you have friends or family members who walked away from faith in Jesus or maybe you walked away from faith in Jesus and you're not even sure why you're watching this video. And it's understandable because if you don't know the story of the Bible, it's very difficult to continue to embrace the stories in the Bible. And the problem is that the way you and I got our Bibles, is not the way the world got the Bible. By the time you and I got our Bibles, it had chapters and verses, it was footnoted, there were maps and cross-references or Maybe you just got it on your phone, and the first time you saw it, it was done. And some of us were told, uh, the Bible's your guide for life, and you were told to read it every day. Others of you grew up in a religious tradition where you were told, uh, you know, common people shouldn't try to read the Bible and understand it, you should respect it. And you and your family respected it. <laughs> Nobody actually read it. And so for many of us, uh, if the Bible says it, well, that settles it for you. But for others of you, you didn't grow up with the Bible. Your family didn't talk about it. And you're just now coming to the understanding of it. And it's just not as simple as the Bible says it and that settles it. Because somewhere along the way, somebody pointed out to you something that the Bible said and you found yourself having a really difficult time reconciling what you had found in the Bible with the reality that you live in. And because you're an honest person, you just can't pretend to buy it so maybe because of what you discovered in the Bible, you walked away, or perhaps you're considering walking away. If that's you, I hope you'll really pay attention and give me a few minutes of your time. Uh, you might be surprised to learn the story of the Bible. It doesn't begin in the beginning. The story of how the Bible came to be 
actually starts at the end of the middle of the Bible itself. It begins with a doctor named Luke who lived in the first century. Luke had a wealthy friend named Theophilus who had heard enough stories about Jesus and had met enough of the eyewitnesses of Jesus' life and miracles that he had put his faith in Jesus. But Theophilus wanted an orderly account of how this whole thing transpired. It's a little bit like hearing about somebody that you have a lot of respect for and you hear bits and pieces of the story and you have two or three quotes, but at some point it's like, okay, I want to know the whole story, not just little bits and pieces. So Luke set out to write an orderly account of the events of the life of Jesus. In fact, this is how this document begins. Now, in your Bible, it's called the Gospel of Luke, but it's important for us to remember that name would actually come later. At first, this was just a historical report on the life of Jesus. And here is how Luke started his report. Many have undertaken to draw up an account or a document of the things that have been fulfilled or the things that have happened among us. Now, note that he says, I'm talking about something that happened, something that was worth documenting. And Luke mentions that he's not the only one documenting the things Jesus did, and that's pretty important. There are not many cases in ancient history where there are multiple written accounts of the same event or series of events. In fact, we have virtually no record of multiple written accounts of the same events in ancient history. These writings about the life of Jesus stand alone in that regard. Luke goes on. I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, or the beginning of Jesus' life. I too, along with a lot of other people, decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Now listen close here because this is also really important. When Luke is writing this document for Theophilus, Luke was not writing the Bible. Luke had no idea what we call the Bible would ever exist. Luke could not even begin to imagine that 2,000 years later, there would be something that included what he wrote along with what other people had written about Jesus. Luke isn't writing the Bible. He is writing an orderly account of the events of Jesus' life based on eyewitnesses. And Luke, because of the way he did it, tells us why and how the story of the Bible actually began. Because when it became clear to the people who followed Jesus in the first century that the things Jesus claimed about himself were true, that's when the story of the Bible actually began. Jesus claimed too many things about himself. I mean, he said and did some wonderful things, but Jesus said too much about himself. And when Jesus was crucified, which is also a historical fact that no one really disputes, there are other non-Christian writings from the same time that tell us that Jesus was crucified by the Roman Empire. And when he was, a man named Joseph took Jesus' body off the cross, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. Luke gives us all this detail because he's a doctor, he's detail-oriented, he's trying to write an orderly, detailed account. He details that the women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph of Arimathea to the tomb. And then these women went home and they prepared spices and perfumes because they were going to embalm the body. Why would they come and embalm the body? Because Jesus was dead and everybody expected Jesus to stay dead. And at this point, there are no Jesus followers. There is no church. There is no hope. There are just broken-hearted women and disillusioned disciples that are scared for their own lives. And if it had ended there, there would be no the Bible, and there would be no Christians, and there would be no church. The only reason Luke documented the life of Jesus is because the story of Jesus didn't end on a cross. It was just the beginning. Luke tells us the reason that he's a Jesus follower is because Jesus was seen alive and once he came back to life, his followers came out of hiding and they went to Jerusalem and they went to the streets of Jerusalem and they faced down the very people that had crucified Jesus. And they got arrested and they had to face down the very men who were responsible for putting Jesus to death in the first place. And Luke documents these early sermons. In fact, Here's just one sentence from one sermon that Luke documents. 
Uh, Peter, one of Jesus' followers, says, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are witnesses of it. We didn't read about it. We didn't hear about it. We saw him. And so the Jesus movement, the church was birthed, but there's no Bible. Luke goes on to document what happens for the next about 30 years following the resurrection. He documents it in a book uh, in the New Testament. It's called Acts or Acts of the Apostles. Uh, Luke knew Peter. He talks to Peter. Luke knows John. Uh, he knows James, the brother of Jesus. Luke traveled with Paul, who took the message of Jesus out of that little country of Israel all around the Mediterranean area. And Luke carefully documents the rise of the non-Jewish church, which led to people like me uh, knowing Jesus. And the church became less Jewish and more focused just on Jesus. And eventually the church, this Jesus movement, it would ultimately shape Western civilization. In fact, the most secular of secular historians all acknowledge that Christianity shaped and greatly impacted all of Western civilization. But remember what Luke said. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of these things that have been fulfilled of the things that happened among us. And the question that we all should wrestle with is, in a world where almost nothing was documented more than once, why are there so many documents of these events? Back then, I mean, it's so expensive to write. Most of the people were illiterate anyway. Why would Luke and why would so many others feel compelled to document these events that happened in the first century surrounding the city of Jerusalem? Why would they do it multiple times? And I and uh, many other people believe that the answer is because something extraordinary happened. Something that had to be preserved because of Peter and all the followers of Jesus, they weren't getting any younger and their lives were threatened constantly. So several of them, they sat down and they dictated and they wrote an account of their experiences with Jesus. In fact, Peter, the apostle, Peter, he dictated an account to a young man named John Mark. We know this from a second century writer named Pappas who tells us that the gospel of Mark came from the lips of Peter. Peter, who was a Jewish fisherman, was probably illiterate. And illiterate doesn't mean dumb, it just means you can't read or write. So consequently, he sat down and he gave him the story. And when you read Mark's document, uh, it's this short, action-packed story, it's almost like a fisherman would, would tell you a story. It's bottom line, it's event-driven. And again, John Mark, he doesn't just know Peter. He knew Paul, he knew Matthew. He knew John, he knew all the people you read about. Luke says, several people sat down to document this extraordinary event. Matthew's one of them. We call it the Gospel of Matthew, but uh, before it was called a Gospel, it was just simply a document, a document addressing first century Jews to, to say, hey, trust me, Jesus is the one you've been waiting for. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, and he leverages all these Old Testament passages, one Old Testament passage after another Old Testament pa passage to an Old Testament prophecy saying, look, all of the prophets, all the law, all the prophets pointed to the coming of the Messiah, and Jesus fulfills them. Here's something you need else need to consider. We know that Matthew's document, it's first written in Hebrew, which makes sense because it's written to Jews, but then it gets translated into Greek. And so you have to ask yourself, why would Greeks translate a Hebrew document? It's because this is simply is not a message just to Hebrews. This is a message for the whole world. So you know the story of Luke and Mark and Matthew. But then there's the Gospel of John. And remember, it wasn't called that because John wasn't writing the Bible. John was an old man when he decided that he too needed to write down the stories and the experiences that he had with Jesus. And you might think, why bother? Others have already written about it. Well, here's how John answers in his own words at the end of his book. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. Don't forget, by this book, John is not talking about 
the Bible. This book is a reference to the document he's writing. He says there are many other things that Jesus did, and not just in front of the 12 disciples, but the hundreds of disciples that followed Jesus throughout his ministry that don't show up in my account of the life of Jesus. And then he says something so important. But these, the ones I've chosen, these are written that you may believe. Don't miss this, you includes you and me. John is saying, the reason I've written this account of the life of Jesus is so that whoever stumbles across this document will know what I saw happened. I want them to know who I spent my life with so that future generations will know what changed my life. So they would know that what gave me hope in the face of being threatened with death, hope that helped me survive being put in prison, And even though I'm the last of Jesus' 12 disciples alive, I still have hope because I know who I saw die and come back to life. This is why I wrote down what I've seen and heard so you might believe. And if you're watching this and you're just thinking, okay, well, you know, it's good for you, but I just can't believe it or I don't believe it anymore. The question that I hope you'll wrestle to the ground and the one that John wants to help you with is this. What is the it that you don't believe? If you walked away from faith or you considered it or you are considering it, what is the it that you don't believe? Is that the same it that John wants you to believe? Because it's not about the Bible. It's about an event. It's about a life. It's about a person. John, an eyewitness who spent time with Jesus, who was standing at the cross when he died and who ran to the tomb three days later and saw him alive, John says, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That just means God's chosen one. And that by believing, you would have life in his name. Regardless of what you've heard, regardless of what you've seen from the church or what you've experienced in your life as a Christian or at the hands of Christians, John says, this is it. And that it's the only thing that really matters. And the implication of this statement, well, they're huge. It's why I've often said, if if John's document of Jesus' life was all we had, it'd be all you needed. Because he said, I didn't write everything, but I have written these things in such a way that if this is the only message you stumble across, It's enough to have confidence that God has done something in the world that changes how you see God and how you can relate to him. Because, see, it's a statement in in this document John wrote that becomes one of the most well-known statements about God anywhere. John's the one that wrote, for God so loved the whole world. Just the Jewish world? No. The world of good people? No. God loved the whole world so much that he sent his son, that whoever believes, and and John makes up a compound word here. He says that, that believes in, or whoever puts their trust in, they will not perish, but will have a life that has an everlasting quality to it. John calls it eternal life. John says, if this is all you ever heard, this would be all you ever needed. And he wrote this right about the end of the first century about 270 years before the Bibles ever assembled. There was no Bible at the end of the first century, but there were these thousands and thousands of Christians, Jewish Christians, Greek Christians, Roman Christians, African Christians, Asian Christians, and there are dozens and then hundreds and eventually thousands of copies of individual documents that John and Matthew and Mark and Luke and Paul had written. And they're floating around telling us about the life and the words of Jesus and people treasure them. They meticulously copy them. They're bundled together and some people have a gospel and another person has two gospels and some people have a a gospel and a copy of one of Paul's letters. I mean, can you imagine if you were a follower of Jesus at the turn of the second or third century? Can you imagine how valuable these documents would have been to you? That perhaps you would only have heard the stories of Jesus and then somebody comes into your town and they bring, and maybe it's your grandfather and he shows up and he says, hey, let me show you something. And then he uncovers 
a full copy of John's recollection of the life of Jesus. Can you imagine to have a parent or a grandparent who had actually heard Peter or John preach and they told you to the best of their memory what Peter and John had preached and then one day somebody comes to your town or your village and they say, look, look, we, we have an actual copy of the letter that Peter wrote. And can you even imagine? And the whole time, the Roman Empire is ramping up their persecution for Christians. So if you're caught with Christian literature, you could lose your life after you watched your wife, your daughter, your son lose their lives in that order. And hundreds and hundreds of Christians risked their lives to copy John's document and Luke's document. Not the Bible. There is no Bible. They risked their lives to protect fragments of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and bundles of two or three gospels and copies of the letters of Paul and letters of Peter. Why would they do that? Because Jesus loves them. This they know. Because John and Peter and Matthew and people who were with Jesus told them what had happened on earth when God came in Jesus to show us what he's really like. This is a story of how we got the Bible. But more than just hearing that story, I want you to hear what coming to meet Jesus when John and Peter and Matthew and the rest of them told me what that's done in my life. I was a person who did what I wanted, when I wanted, how I wanted, and I really didn't care who got hurt. And the person most hurt was me. I was living a life surrounded by death, relational death. There's the death of the self-control in me as I became addicted, death to honesty as I became a liar. And then I met Jesus. And as I turned my life toward him, as I believed in, I put my trust in him, not believe that, that there was a man named Jesus who died and gave his life for me. And one day, in spite of how bad my life has been, he'll take me to heaven one day. Not that. It happened because daily I placed my trust in him that today I choose to believe what he says, not what I think, to believe that he's right about everything. And I allow that to govern my life. My life's changed. Over time, I have a whole different life. It's been like I, I've been born again, which is something that John tells us Jesus said would happen to lives. That my life story uh, could fold into a greater story that God's been telling throughout history. The story that Jesus embodied on the cross, the story that we've been talking about throughout this whole video series, a, a story of God's great love for us, taking all of the brokenness of our world and our personal stories and re restoring them into his new and eternal life. And not just our future, right here, right now. Your life story can be about more than just bad decisions you've made or bad things that have happened to you. Your life story can become a part of God's story of redemption and healing and wholeness that is perfectly seen in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. All you have to do is to choose for his story to be your story and then live as Jesus would live in your life. Uh, now, to be clear, I, I don't believe a one-time decision will will lead you to a life of meaning that you've always wanted. Nor do I expect one video, it's untangled all your questions and doubts for you. It's gonna be a longer journey than that. It'll take you stepping out of isolation and into relationship. It's why we say church is not content you consume, it's a community you commit yourself to. If you want to know if the new life of Jesus actually works, then you've got to get up close and personal with some of the people who've seen it work in their lives. And so I'd like to personally invite you to join our community here. You can text the word JOIN to the number you've seen on the screen, and I'd love to talk to you. I'll respond about how we can get you in community with people where you can see God at work in action. Or you can go to our website, cccanywhere.com, and you'll see a lot of ways to get connected to our community there including the card that says join our Facebook group where you'll be redirected to our Facebook community where if you click join the group button, you'll be able to connect with other people from around the country who are learning from Jesus what it means to love everyone always. But whatever step you take, do not end this video without taking one into community because Jesus is offering you a new story for your life. 
It's not complicated, but there is a way to do it. And you'll need a community to help you. And we want to walk with you no matter who you are. Because no matter what you think about God, He can't stop thinking about you. And we want to help you find new life in Him.